G'day, welcome back to RC Model Reviews, another not so weekly, weekly news for another not so week. And quite a bit to cover today, lots of things happening in the hobby, and I'm glad I actually made a copy of this video about four or five days ago, but things have changed dramatically since then. So I'm going to run through some of the stuff that's changed. First of all, Remote ID. That's supposed to, it was supposed to come into effect on the 16th of this month, September 2022. Now the FAA have said, well, <laughs> yeah, when, we know manufacturers are not ready, so we are going to, um, it's interesting, they haven't actually pushed out the deadline for implementing phase one, which is the need for every pre-built, that's bind and fly or ready to fly drone, weighing more than 250 grams, the need for those craft to have standard remote ID fitted out of the box, they haven't changed that but they've said we, we, we may not be enforcing until December. Yeah, may not be enforcing until December. I'm not saying we won't enforce, but we might not enforce. Basically, what a dog's breakfast. I mean, if a rule is a good rule, you enforce it. If you're not going to enforce it, it's obviously not a good rule. Why didn't they just push out that September 16th date to December 16th or something like that, instead of saying, well, it's still gonna come into effect, but we may choose not to enforce it. That's like saying, if you catch us on a bad day, we're gonna rip you a new one, but if we've had our share of donuts and we're happy, we'll let you get away with it. It's No, that's not how good regulation works. That's not how good enforcement works. So the FAA have said we may not, well, we, we may not enforce this for another three months. And that's just not good enough. It shows you how bad this whole remote ID thing has become. The rule itself is bad. The, the goals are perhaps laudable, but the method is just crap. I mean, we haven't had a problem. Remember way back when they first mooted registration, we were told drone operators, some of them are behaving irresponsibly. So we're going to make them register and put the registration number on the drone. Then they will be held accountable. That will reduce the problem. Well, people did that and in theory, that should have reduced the problem. People are held accountable. Now they're saying, oh, no, 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 we must have a beacon on the drones so that now they'll be held accountable. Oh, God, where do they end? It's, it's nothing. It's not really about safety. If it was about safety, they wouldn't be including model aircraft, which have never been a, a problem. And they wouldn't be including things like freestyle drones where people are not flying them in a way that endangers people or property. So yeah, it's, it's nothing to do with safety. We know what the real agenda is, don't we? But it's unspoken, we can't talk about that. And we know why all the, the panels and the arcs and the committees that are creating rules for the recreational flyers are loaded with commercial operators. There's, no, there's not a lot of representation from the, hobby, from the hobby on these panels, these groups, these committees, these arcs. We get like one voice. And even then, the, the people representing us, I'm not always sure they do a good job. They claim to be hobbyists, or oh, we're hobbyists. And, uh, but if you look carefully, two of the hobbyists are basically commercial operators as well. So when it comes to the toss, are we going to be speaking on behalf of commercial operators or on behalf of hobbyists? Which way do you think they'll go? They'll follow the money like everybody else. It's just absolutely atrocious that we, the hobby, have let it get this far. But this isn't a rant, this is the news. So let's move on. And big announcement recently, the DJI Avata and Goggles 2. And people have rushed out to buy this thing. And I've got to be totally honest. I have to be totally honest. Now, they didn't send me one. They didn't send Joshua Bardwell one. They didn't send many people these drones. Mainly just influencers. You know, not necessarily people who know anything about drones, but people who know how to influence other people to buy drones. So we saw the you know the typical social media influencers they got them um, and Nurk got them but Nurk isn't really or Nurk is looking at it from a cinematography perspective and he's done a really good job reviewing it and I'd say go and have a look at as many reviews as you can I was going to do a meta review where I looked at because I don't have one looked at all the other people's reviews and tried to sort of find common themes and points that you know were consistent within reviews so I could perhaps give you an, an a overview of what I saw but the bottom line is it looks like a pretty decent little drone if you don't mind buying into the DJI ecosystem which means geofencing and remote ID and things like that, which, you know, I'm not really a fan of. But um, if you're happy with that thing, then, then the little drone itself doesn't look too bad. But it is, it is a cine whoop. It is loud. It does have reasonably good flight times for a cine whoop, but it's still, you know, we're talking about sub 10 minutes mostly, I think. And it is over 250 grams, so you'll have to register and has to have remote ID. I'll get to that later. But um, yeah, there are a number of downsides and it looks like there are some issues with the battery falls out sometimes. If you have a crash, the battery pops out. Well, if you're in long grass, you may never find the damn thing. There's been a couple of instances I've seen where the remote to home, a remote return to home, hasn't really functioned as desired. I know one guy's lost one and other people have had issues as well with that. So it's, it's a new craft. There's going to be a few bugs. So you, you might want to wait until the next revision of the software and I've got some of those bugs out. Also, it tends to overheat a bit, which again, if you lose it in long grass and it overheats and shuts down, you're never going to find the damn thing, are you? So there's some, some issues 
there um, to be looked at. Now there is an FCC hack for this thing, it's a really simple one, it's just a text file you put in the goggles and wham you've got FCC power levels which is great if you live in Europe because I see other people have lost their drones due to the, the 25 milliwatt restriction which gives you next to no range if you're going behind objects or through trees and things. Um, so yeah switch to the FCC hack as soon as you can if you've got one of these little drones but I mean hey uh, not having one um, and setting aside my own personal not grievances but concerns with DJI I say it's a great looking drone great little drone probably people will be very happy with it I've got to be objective I can't say oh I don't like this so I'm not gonna I'm giving you the facts as I see them looks like it's a pretty good little drone and price wise if you don't already have an investment in FPV it's probably a reasonably good deal by the time you take into account decent goggles decent drone and the and if you especially if you get the little controller you know you'll need this little controller unless you use a little hand sticky thing I don't recommend using the little hand sticky thing because I saw Bubby FPV on Rotor Right. He nearly did poo poo in his pants when he tried that out. He got all excited and carried away. It was fun to watch. <laughs> anyway, um, but that's the situation with the Avata drone. I've got some notes here. I better check I haven't missed anything on that. Yeah, hack. Oh, yeah, one thing I've noticed. One thing I've noticed with that a lot of the videos I see comes up with stick error, little red box, stick error, stick error. Um, when people are using the DJI remote, why is that? And I saw a video this week also of someone with the original DJI FPV drone who lost it because of this stick error thing flying in manual mode and it fail safe or something happened it, it come up with this error stick error and there was nothing he could do to get out of it and instead of having returned to home as his default option it was set to hover in place if the signal was lost so just sat there hovering over the sea until the battery went flat and it went in the water and they lost it there was nothing he tried cycling the power he tried everything nothing worked lost it because the stick error and I see that error coming up on lots of videos for the Avata why is that why is there a stick error what the hell is going on maybe we'll find out maybe we won't and speaking of something very similar to the Avatar Avata it is the Avatar I have the Walksnail Avatar here so I want to find out I've got this thank you uh, Walksnail sent this to me I have to say Cadex Walksnail sent this to me I didn't spend my own hard-earned money on it because I don't have enough at the moment but but they sent that to me because I want to get to the bottom why are some people having a really good experience with that system and others not so good there seems to be a bit of a gap even running the same version of the software some people are, are happy with the image other people like Mads uh, Tech uh, think it's too dark and it's it's sort of all reddish and it doesn't work very well I well I'm going to put my own eyes behind it and find out for myself I'll do the uh, uh, no point in doing a full review I think but I'm going to follow through and find out what I can about why it works for some why it doesn't work for others and I'll give you my honest opinion of how I think it stacks up to the uh, the DJI system you know the original DJI FPV system and perhaps the HD0 and, and analog because uh, the uh, uh, Fox Air people I've said to them I want to do a really good analog build I want to do the best we can do with analog so they're sending me the best camera the best video transmitter the best antennas I'm going to set up a model with the very best of analog and we're going to put it alongside the other digital options it's not going to be nearly as good in terms of picture quality and, and range and stuff like that but I just want to see what the gap is now now that we've got better digital systems and we've got better analog just how big is that gap because there are still a lot of people who still fly analog I'm one of them I fly digital and analog I fly everything and I went I must say I went back to analog yesterday and I was kind of shocked because I've been flying digital with these systems checking stuff out and I was getting used to the the picture quality I went back to analog and I thought oh this isn't very good but then again after a couple of flights on analog I was thinking this is great I love it so yeah I'm gonna look a bit deeper into that so Foxy have provided their best analog system for me I may talk to Runcam see if they want to provide their best analog system and and maybe any maybe Cadex uh, will want to provide their best analog system I want to see what we can still do with this old technology that just continues to work and is completely compatible with everything and isn't that expensive now a little chat about ELRS uh, the um, what it was I can't remember it's express long range system <laughs> here we go I'm getting old um, yeah ELRS now previously ELRS version 2 and below was really sort of for anything with a flight controller all the receivers EP1 EP2 they, they had a, a crossfire protocol serial bus output you had to use a flight controller to, to basically fly them so that was like quads and maybe FPV wings and things like that but then Beta FPV brought out their little PWM receivers little five channel PWM receivers they sent me two now they're both bricked um, Beta FPV I mean I don't know this is just an opinion right this is you know based on my experience they, they have some good innovative ideas but they, the first version of a product always seems a little bit dodgy so it's very easy to brick those PWM receivers and because they don't have any way to flash through through um, beta flight or, or flash you know pass through or anything like that there's no way to apart from Wi-Fi 
If you brick them and the Wi-Fi doesn't work and you're stuffed, they do make a little dongle apparently. But I don't have that dongle, so my Betaflight PWM receivers are sitting on the bench. They're useless to me, unfortunately. I wanted to review them and I got really good results to start with, but then when I brick them in an update, completely useless. So I can't really recommend them unless you buy the dongle. I don't have the dongle to test that out. Maybe Beta FPV, if you're watching, send me a dongle and I'll bring them back to life. But Radio Master to the rescue, I've seen, I haven't got them, they haven't sent me them yet. Um, they have got some PWM receivers, which is brilliant because in conjunction with uh, ELRS version three and above, now ELS, ELRS radios are every bit as useful as the FlySky, FreeSky, whatever, the standard 2.4 gig protocols, the ones that you're used to having with receivers that have servo connectors uh, for fixed wing line of sight stuff and so forth. Um, this suddenly brings ELRS into that arena now, and I'm so glad because I have the um, T16, well they've sent me a couple of radios, T16 and um, I've got the Zorro with ELRS and I've got the new 12, TX12 with E, I think that's ELRS, haven't checked yet, I haven't opened the box, haven't had that time. But these radios now, there's no reason not to switch to ELRS because Radio Masters provided big transmitters, little transmitters, everything ELRS, and now with the receivers, you can use them as a complete plug and play replacement for your old ACCST Free Sky stuff and but get better range, get lower latency, and Brilliant. So this, I think, is where the hobby is headed. ELRS will probably eclipse most other protocols because it's really available, it's, it's cheap, and it just damn well works. And now it's suited to line of sight aircraft without flight controllers, aircraft that just have servos and a receiver. Brilliant. I will be trying to migrate all my stuff over to ELRS. Fantastic. And as I say, Radio Master have done a fantastic job in bringing out radios that are ELRS uh, based. Um, I know the Zorro doesn't get much flight time, but I haven't had a problem. I take the power bank, my power bank to the field, and between flights I plug it into the power bank. So it's always, you know, 7.8 volts or above when I'm flying, even if I fly all day. It's a simple solution to that problem. So I'm really looking forward to looking at the, the Radio Master PWM receivers, and I'm pretty sure I'll be as impressed with them as I am with most of their other stuff. Now I mentioned at the top of the news bulletin that the FCC had chosen or said that they won't necessarily enforce the new standard remote ID rule that comes into effect on the 16th of this month. They're going to um, basically not enforce until December. Or they have the option, they, they may choose not to enforce. It's all really left open. If they wanted to, they could throw the book at you, but they're saying, hey, we probably won't. <laughs> Leaves everyone in limbo. But one of the things they've also put up is a list of craft that have been accepted as being remote ID compliant. And there's a lot of DJI craft in there. I'm just looking at the computer across the way here. And it says the M30T, the M30, the Mavic 3 Cine, the Mavic 3, the Avata, the Air 2S, the Mini 3 Pro. And I see Avata in there, I'm thinking, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. The, the Avata, it comes with a little pistol grip remote and it has the drone and the goggles. So. Part of the standard remote ID specification says that the, the broadcast must include the position of the drone, which it gets from its onboard GPS, not a problem, and the position of the operator. Not, not, where, not the home point, but the position where the operator is standing in real time. So if you take off from a particular point and you walk 100 meters away, then the information broadcast must reflect the fact that you are 100 meters away from where you took off. Your actual position, not your start position. So where does it get the GPS? to provide that information to the drone. Where's the GPS on the operator? I mean, I don't know. And of course, because the, uh, you might say, maybe it's in the version, the goggles too. I don't know, I haven't seen inside the goggles too. I know Mads did a teardown, but I don't know how far he got. I haven't actually seen the video, but um, is there a GPS in the goggles too? But even if there was a GPS in the goggles too, it still doesn't uh, mean that I don't think that craft should be on the remote ID list because it, it you can use them with the version two goggles. And I know that the DJI version two goggles don't have a GPS in them. So how will the drone know where the operator is standing? Remember, this is standard remote ID, which has, in theory, was supposed to come into effect on the 16th of this month. Now it says remote ID. It doesn't differentiate on these, uh, on this list from the FAA, whether it's standard remote ID or remote ID. But given that the uh, the Avata is a store-bought, ready-to-fly drone, then it should be standard remote ID as of the 16th of this month. But if it's standard remote ID, I don't see where it gets the GPS coordinates of the operator from, unless you're supposed to operate it with your phone. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, you can take your, your version two goggles without GPS, your Avata drone, and your little motion controller handpiece without GPS, and go and fly the thing. So how on earth can it be standard remote ID compliant without any way of telling where the operator is on the ground? 
This is this whole remote ID thing, as I said, it's just a dog's breakfast. It really is. If they're giving, um, saying that this is remote ID compliant and it can't provide the standard remote ID information, how does the FCC even know what they're doing? I don't think anybody does. I think this is just hopefully in by the time that the 2023 deadline rolls around, everyone, everyone will have had enough and said, FAA, you can stick this where the sun doesn't shine. We're not going to, we're not interested. We don't want to know. It serves no purpose except to add a financial burden to drone operators, which is unnecessary. Certainly to fixed wing flyers, model aircraft flyers. There's no reason on God's good earth why we should have to have a transmitter, a beacon in our aircraft when, when, even though we're seeing mid-air collisions taking place on such a regular basis between manned aircraft and the USA, the, the number of deaths, if just last month the line was ridiculous and there are mid-air collisions, yet manned aircraft operating outside of controlled airspace are not required to have ADSB. They don't need to have a, a beacon broadcasting their position, but your toys will need it. Your, your yeah, 251 gram foam model of a Piper Cub will need a remote ID transmitter on it in a year's time. <laughs> Where, no, these things aren't killing people. Our models aren't killing people, but manned aircraft is. And if, how many lives would they save if every manned aircraft had to have ADS-B on it, regardless of where, which airspace it was operating in? That would save lives. Putting little remote IDs on toys, it's not going to save any lives. It is simply a method of making it so onerous for real hobbyists to continue enjoying the hobby that they move out of the hobby. They, they, they give it up and the airspace is more available to the likes of Google and Amazon and anyone else that wants to step in and commercialize it for money. That's the real, as I said, that's the real thing we're facing. It's nothing to do with safety. In fact, I've said this on many occasions, I'm going to say it again, and this news bulletin's turning into a rant, I apologize, but I've said so often that if this was really about safety, if safety was the overriding consideration, then we would have a risk assessment. And every rule that the FAA or the CIA or Transport Canada or CASA rolls out would reference the risk assessment and say, this rule is necessary because the risk assessment has identified this as a risk of sufficient magnitude to warrant a mitigation rule. But they don't. Not one country has done the risk assessment because they all know that risk assessment would not support the level of regulation and restriction that they're imposing on our hobby. It wouldn't support it in the least, so it's better just to say, oh, no, no, we haven't done that. <laughs> it, would, it would destroy the myth that this is about safety, and they don't want to do that. As long as they continue to say, no, 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 um, they, they create a perception that it's safety, and it's just unacceptable. Anyway, that's the news. The news for another Not So Weekly Week, and if you've got comments, you know where to go. And uh, I thank my Patreon supporters. Um, now, oh, one last thing, I had it on my list here, actually, ADSB alarm. I have 3D printers in the background, woo, printing up the case, fantastic. But there are no Raspberry Pis to be had for love nor money. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> hopefully, that's such, I think the situation is supposed to come right in a couple of months. So definitely, um, the all the stuff will be up on GitHub within, I would say, six weeks at this stage. I've got I've still got some tidying up to do and um, there's a couple of 3D cases to print and some stuff to do. So anyway, that'll all be going up there and the phone app to finish off. It's got a couple of bugs, a couple of bugs and the phone app. Anyway, that'll all be up there. So in time for the Southern Flying season at least we'll have our ADSB alarms providing Raspberry Pi boards are also available. And there you go. Been working long and hard on that. It, it, it's, it's our, I consider it the hobbies initiative showing that we are doing something towards safety, not just making up stupid rules that we're not going to bother to implement because we've been caught with our trousers down like you FAA. It's a case of the hobby is doing something positive, something that will boost safety, not just make people pissed off because you're ruining their hobby. There you go. <laughs> what a, that's the not so weekly weekly rant from RC Model Reviews. And as I say, thank you to my Patreon supporters. You are the lifeline of this channel. And as you can see, I've got a lot of stuff to review coming up. And it's spring. The southern spring has arrived. That's why the rain is warmer today. And uh, you can feel it. You can feel the warmth in the rain. And that means more flying, more chance to test things out at the field. I've got more review stuff coming. And this summer, uh, especially with the death of the Queen, it reminds you, treat every day as if it's your last. Because one day you'll be right. And so cram as much as you can into your days. That's what I intend to do. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now. It's outrageous. It's unbelievable. It's uncalled for. It's incredible. How does he do it? How does RC Model Reviews make these videos without mid-roll ads? Well, it's all thanks to his Patreon supporters. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, there's a link down there in the description of it.